Okay, you're on. So today we're talking about the calendar. This is an interesting one. So the current calendar, that's the current Jewish calendar I'm talking about here, is uh, basically, it's more lunar, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, what, what, what's so funny? Looney? It's a, a lunar. Hello? Hello? Uh, it's a loony solar. Loony could yeah. also be spelled differently. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I didn't think of it that way, but it is funny. <laughs> so it's a loony so it's a crazy solar calendar, a loony solar calendar, which uh, originated in Babylon. So uh, the Ranban or Nachmanides raises the uh, issue of why is it that when the Jews return back to Judea during the early Second Temple period, that they keep the Babylonian months to the calendar, the names of the months. Think about some of our months. Tammuz, it's a Babylonian god. It's not exactly a Jewish sounding name. If you look sometimes with Tanakh, we'll talk about months and say, uh, I forgot what it's called, but the seventh month is is referred to when uh, Shlomo builds the first Beit HaMikdash, builds the first temple. The original name is present in the Tanakh. Later on, the seventh month becomes Tammuz. <coughs> I'm you know, Tamu, so uh, no, I'm sorry, not Tom <laughs> Tishrei. I'm sorry, it's the phone. Tamu is it's over the summer. Sorry about that. So, uh, so the Ranban says that the reason why it's the reason why we kept the Babylonian names is to remember that we were in exile and were we redeemed from exile by God, kind of like the second exodus, as Isaiah puts it. So, uh, so that's the reason why we still have Babylonian names in our standard. Jewish calendar, but of course we're going to see the Qumran sect had a different calendar. We'll get to that eventually. Okay, our calendar, just so we're doing this so we could compare and contrast, the, is a 12-month calendar, and it's 11 days short of the 365 solar year. And the reason it is because, because uh, the reason that we have a corrective, a leap year, or a leap month, we should say, really, and we have it 7 out of 19 years, is because Pesach is called Hag Ha'aviv, the festival of the spring. So you can't celebrate Pesach in the winter, the summer, or the fall. It has to be in the spring. Now, this year it was very early spring, but it's always in the spring. So if you have a strictly uh, lunar calendar without the, without the corrective, think about the Muslim calendar. You could have Ramadan. They just finished, or they're, or they're, fin they're, still, or they're still in Ramadan, or they're finishing Ramadan. But Ramadan could be in any of the four seasons. It doesn't happen in Judaism. We have a spread of a few weeks, sometimes uh, two, three weeks differences if we compare it to uh, our regular solar calendar. But we don't have those large fluctuations you'd have in the Muslim calendar. Okay, leap year, seven out of 19 years. Okay, so we had alternative calendars in antiquity. So the, the first of all, a regular solar calendar, we know 52 weeks uh, totaling. 364 days a year when we have the leap year every once in a while we, we know we know all this okay so <clears throat> if you have if you have uh if you're using a strictly solar calendar the holidays will come out on the same day every week so the first day uh the fir uh, uh, first day of uh sukkot would always be on tuesday or whatever it was i'm just making up a day Okay, now it was short actually of a solar year by 1.25 days. And they don't know how they compensated it over the difference to make up for time to keep the date, keep it, keep, to always keep things consistent. But basically, it was a self regulating system that was relatively consistent with the holidays always falling on the same days of each year. It's like nowadays we do it a different way. We, we say we're going to celebrate the holiday on Monday, even if it's not on Monday that type of thing. So this calendar always said, we're going to have Pesach on this day of the week, we're going to have Shavuot on that day of the week, and you get the idea. Okay. <laughs> and they did not have a leap, they did not have a leap uh, day in it like we have in our modern calendar because it would throw off the day, it would throw off the day. Like, uh, you, usually the system is this, I'm just trying to think when my birthday was this year, and usually it's always one day later the next year, if your birthday is on a Monday, uh, the following year, it's usually on a Tuesday, things like that. Okay. Now, that's all kind of interesting, but in the weeds a little bit, unless you really like the math part of it. I'm certainly not a math person. But what is of importance here is this calendar, this solar calendar, 
is reflected in the Book of Enoch and Jubilees, which are apocryphal books, which the uh, sect valued these apocryphal works here. Okay, and what the sect, the sect was particularly interested in castigating other Jews for celebrating the holidays on the wrong days. So the sect, if they believed that Rosh Hashanah was always supposed to fall on a, uh, on a Tuesday, let's say, and you had others celebrating it on a Thursday, they would say, look at these horrible people. They're celebrating Rosh Hashanah, the most important day of Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, which we'll get to in a minute and talk about that. They're celebrating Yom Kippur on the wrong date or violating Yom Kippur. Well, what's the penalty for violating Yom Kippur? It's a big deal when you violate these holidays. So, so you could really see why this was important to them. A lot more important than some of the minutia type of issues we spoke about last time, such as which way is the impurity flowing? Does it just pure flow downwards into the vessel on the bottom or does the vessel on, on the bottom send up a stream of impurity back to the vessel which, it's being, which is doing the pouring? This is much easier, easier for us to understand why this was so important here. I mean, just think about it nowadays. If someone said to you, instead of celebrating Shavuot on, uh, on Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday, celebrate it on uh, Thursday or a week later or something like that, it would cause a lot of confusion and <laughs> be very fractious to the community, obviously. So we have a good example it comes from Pesher Habakkuk, just so you remember what Pesher Habakkuk is. This is... Well, Habakkuk is one of the uh, Treyas, or one of the, the 12 quote-unquote minor prophets. They weren't really minor. They just wrote less. But these books, these books are in the, uh, the Treyas, or the prophetical work. <coughs> and Pesher means that it, it looks at, it, look, it, takes, it takes, the, uh, takes a biblical text, let's say Habakkuk, who lived earlier on, and it says, we don't really, we're not really interested in what Habakkuk was saying in context of his own time, which is a strange thing to say. They're saying, we're only concerned about Habakkuk, what Habakkuk is saying and applying it to our day today. It just like, just, and we see later on in Christianity, we, we have this ideas where people would, where it say, uh, Kadosh, 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 holy, 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 which, we, which is from the, the Nevi'im, the Jewish prophets. So, so later on, the Christians say, well, what is that a reference to the three Kadoshes that we have? It's a reference to the Trinity. Or when we're told that the, um, the, the Alma, the, uh, the young woman would uh, conceive and have a child, they say, no, that's not a prophecy being given immediately to Ahaz, the king of Judah, and his wife. That's really uh, applies 700 years later when uh, Jesus will come on the scene and the word was understood not to be the maiden, but uh, later on took on the meaning of a virgin. So that's what Pesher is doing. But here we have uh, Pesher talking about our subject at hand, where we, ha <coughs> where we have the sect, the sect is arguing on behalf of their date, particularly of Yom Kippur. And what they say is the wicked high priest, remember, we don't know who this character is. He may have been Yonatan, the Hasmonean priest. He may have been another later Hasmonean priest. But they're saying they came and attacked the teacher of righteous on Yom Kippur. And that's the Yom Kippur of the sect. And how do we know that's the Yom Kippur of the sect? Because the teacher, because this wicked high priest, is not going to come on the day, which is his Yom Kippur, to beat up the teacher of the righteous. Even if, even if you could excuse or uh, excuse the word, rationalize the fisticuff says <coughs> he's, um, and it doesn't necessarily, I don't know if it necessarily means he physically beat him up, but it somehow uh, verbally accosted him, chastised him, admonished him, whatever word you want to use. But the point is, he's not going to travel from Yerushalayim out to Qumran on the day he thinks is Yom Kippur. First of all, there's, a, first of all, there's a regulations of Tachum, how far you can travel on Shabbat and Yom Kippur in that sense is considered like a Shabbat, not like the Ever Chagim or some of those, not the Ever Holidays, some of those other restrictions about how far you walk are relaxed. So first of all, you, you, need, you need some sort of animal to take you there. It's, he's not gonna walk there. All that, so he'd have to take an animal, which is another issue. So he's not going to violate the day 
he believes is Yom Kippur, he's going to inconvenience the Qumran sect on the day they think is Yom Kippur. So he's not going to sin, and then he's also going to disrupt the day they think is Yom Kippur. Uh, and according to Qumran, Yom Kippur is always, always falls on a Friday. On our calendar, it never falls on a Friday. It's manipulated by the rabbis, and you could under it doesn't take a genius really to figure out why is because if Yom Kippur ends Friday night, how are you going to have your Shabbat meal? You can't prepare on Yom Kippur. You can't start cooking on Yom Kippur. You can't cook on Yom Kippur at all. And now how are you going to have your Shabbat meal? So it never winds up uh, on, on a Friday. But for the Qumran sect, it was always on a Friday. And another famous one, very time, timely, comes uh, to when, when the holiday of Shavuot is celebrated. Remember, the Torah, unlike other holidays, which gives you a specific date for when the holiday begins, never gives you a specific date for Shavuot. Okay, so that means that you shall count uh, onto for, you shall count from the morrow after the day of rest, from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Seven weeks shall be complete. So that's the description for Shavuot. If you look back, it's talking about in the context of Pesach has just occurred. So it doesn't it doesn't give us a date. It's talking about counting from the morrow after the day of rest, really. So what what in the world does that mean? You could see why you need some sort of Torah Shabal has some sort of oral tradition to understand this. It just it doesn't really it doesn't really give you enough to on, on its own to to date it. Oh, I, I already had the had today. Um, okay, okay. So the, the Peshat, in other words, the, the, the plain reader, the, at least the plainest read here, even if it's not an absolutely plain read, but the easiest read is, it really seems to be saying you're supposed to wait until Pesach is over completely. Then, then, from, uh, then from the next Shabbat, that's when you, the Shabbat after Pesach, that's when you start counting Svirat HaOmer. So we're, we're getting ready to celebrate Pesach we're on a Sunday night, it's going to be, it's going to, we're going to have done the seven complete weeks, the 49 days from the uh, second day of Pesach. But if we were following the Qumran, Qumran calendar, then we wouldn't be doing, uh, we wouldn't be, <coughs> excuse me, doing Shavuot for another week or so. We get kicked back another week because we couldn't even start back out until the Shabbat after, after Pesach. So uh, it, so you could see during this time, you really had the different Jewish sects were sometimes celebrating, uh, celebrating holidays on different days, and it's also a big deal because uh, this this group uh, basically exiled themselves from the from the temple and that community. But uh, if you're let's say <laughs> if you let's say you're a Pharisee and you're celebrate you're doing the count like we do nowadays, and you want to go make your pilgrimage in Jerusalem, and it's under Sadducee in control. The Sadducee is more likely are following the uh this dead sea sect groups count so you may not be able to even come and bring your sacrifices on the appropriate on the appropriate day you may not they may say come back uh, you made your pilgrimage we're not celebrating till next week sorry uh, get a hotel room and hang out i don't know in reality i don't know in reality i've never heard in reality what really went on as far as uh and it does seem to be over as time passes the rabbinic faction seems to gain more and more control. And at times the Sadducees, which were really the priestly elites in the temple, really were really were under their influence to uh, one degree or another. Okay. And I said, uh, likely the Sadducees and later on the Karaites also uh, celebrate Shavuot using this uh, Qumran idea. Not surprising, the, Sa the Sadducees rejected an oral tradition and later on, the Karaites take that and run with it. They reject the oral tradition as well. So they're going to at least the closest literal read of the text. Okay. Uh, and I said the Pharisees said the... So the Pharisees, by the way, why is it that we count? Why is it that we start counting always the second day of Pesach, regardless of the day of week? And it's simply because it says you start counting after the, after the day of rest, after Shabbat. So what does that really mean? So... The rabbi, the Torah Shabbat, the oral law says Pesach, even though it's not Shabbat uh, technically, it, uh, the Chag, the holiday, has an element of Shabbat. It has an element of rest. It's still a day of rest to 
one degree or another, even though on festivals, joy, joy is emphasized a little more. Or on Shabbat, even though the both have elements of both, on Shabbat, rest is emphasized. Manukas are emphasized, emphasized a little more. So, but that's why we always start counting the Omer at the second Seder in Hutzla or it's outside of Israel or in Israel, whatever, the second day, the day after the first day of Pesach, you start counting and that's why it's celebrated as is nowadays. Okay, let's look at the halachic letter, which we've actually already talked about, but it, it actually begins with a section on the calendar. That's why it's introduction basically it starts talking about the calendar. Now, this is interesting. It mentions holidays that are not found in the Torah at all. So you say, what's going on here? Okay, you remember we talked about they believed in an ongoing revelation. The sect, just as Christianity believes in this ongoing revelation during this time period. So where the Pharisaic, appro Pharisaic approach, the rabbinic approach, approach is basically, or is, that the, the five books of Moshe have been canonized. We're not going to have, that's it. We're not going to have any of our biblical holidays if you don't believe, if you still have this ongoing revelation, then you, then you, then you can, then you, and, and not, it's not only that the five books are canonized, it's that they believe prophecy had come to an end during the early second temple period. This is the, uh, this is at the end of the second temple period already. So now what's going on is since they have this ongoing revelation, this group, this sect, uh, they're able to uh, introduce new holidays that uh, that the Pharisees and later on rabbinic Judaism would totally reject and say you have no basis for saying this is a, a new holiday, at least a biblical import. You want to say Hanukkah and Purim, fine, but the, the rabbis never say these are biblical holidays. The rabbis say these are rabbinic in nature, but this is saying they're coming up with these holidays which are biblical in nature, according to the group. And the temple, the temple scroll, which... Uh, which also speaks about holidays, speaks about a wine festival 50 days out of Shavuot. So they like to have Lachayim. They had an oil festival 50 days after the wine festival and a wood festival right after, and they had a wood festival right after the, I, I, that was a typo here. They had a wood festival right after the wine festival. So they, they like their festivals basically. And we have all these festivals that <laughs> we don't have nowadays. Okay, and it's likely that this was one of the real hot button issues of the day. As we said, it's causing confusion. People are celebrating something as basic as major holidays. Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur are being celebrated on different days. Again, which day are going to be celebrated on in the temple? You could see why this is going to be a hot button issue of the day. Okay, and by the way, some believe that the placement of the calendar at the beginning of his halachic letter is placed there not just as uh, informative, but it's used in a polemical nature to differentiate <laughs> their practices with the practices of other Jewish groups. Okay, let's talk about how this impacts the Gospels a little bit. Okay, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're going to we're going to tie we're going to tie this in eventually. I know it seems like we're jumping around. Suddenly, we're talking about the Gospels. So, very brief background on the Gospels. There are four major Gospels, as I think you know. Three of them are called the Synoptic Gospels. Anyone have any idea what, what in the world that means, the Synoptic Gospels? Scott Slomowitz on. <laughs> Doesn't it mean they basically agree that, that those Mark, Luke, and uh, Matthew ah. agree, whereas John is, is different? You're absolutely correct, as expected, Scott. No pressure, but yes. So, so synoptic in the sense that they all think the basic original sources of the first three historical gospels, and I'm giving you an historical order: Mark, Matthew, Luke. Basically, had we're using a uh, similar sources. There was a there was another source I think that has been lost, but they they, they name Q, which no one knows. But there seems to be extra information that seems like it's coming from another source, which no one could find. Q. But these were synop synoptic in nature. Uh, basically, the stories, there's not too much disagreement within the stories. They tend to jive well. So the synoptic gospels have the Last Supper taking place on Pesach itself, okay, as, as, as on the actual day of Pesach. Gospel, gospel of John has it taking place on Era of Pesach. In other words, as uh, just, just, I'm sorry, just one second, everyone. I have a young lady here who I'd like to, can I help you? Okay. 
Thank you very much. Okay, have a good day. Okay, one of our neighbor's children brought food over for us. I'll take it. I'm never going to pass up free food. Okay, so uh, so this so we have the synoptic gospels basically match up, and they have the Last Supper uh, takes place on Pesach itself. Uh, John, which is the latest of the Gospels and is not synoptic, they had the Last Supper taking place on Erev Pesach. And here's the tie-in between what we were talking about, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the calendars. Uh, could it be that the reason why John has the Last Supper taking place on Erev Pesach being that would be when we're getting ready for Pesach as opposed to actually on Pesach itself? Could it be because they were using different calendars? So a one calendar was Arab Pesach and the other calendar, it was Pesach. Interesting argument, but that's not really what scholars think is going on here. What scholars think is going on here is that it was deliberately changed by John to make a theological point. The theological point is, the theological point is Jesus is the new Paschal offering. In other words, when did the Jews offer the Paschal offering? Not on Pesach, on Erev Pesach. You offer it on Erev Pesach during the afternoon, so then at night when Pesach begins, then you can start actually eating. And then you could actually eat the, uh, the the Corbin Pesach. That's supposed to be, even though we, we do it now at the end of the meal, you're supposed to eat the, uh, the matzah symbolizes the, the Corbin Pesach. So it was probably changed to make the point that Jesus is supposed to be the Paschal offering for dramatic effect. And scholars also believe the synop synoptic gospels are probably truer to whatever actually took place simply because there's no, there's no particular point being made. The fact that someone would change it to try to make a theological point makes you have to suspect that it's, be, that it's, not, it's not accurate. There's an incentive to change the story, so it's probably not the true story. I'll give you another example that scholars mentioned that has to do with Jesus, just because it popped into my mind and we're talking about it. Is this in the Gospels? There seems to be a tension. Where is Jesus really from? Is he from, is he from uh, Nazareth, or is he from, or, or is he from, uh, or is he really from uh, Bethlehem? So, what do you say? Is he from Nazareth or Bethlehem? Where do you think he's really from? He's from Nazareth. Okay, that's Susan. Where he grew up. He was born in Bethlehem, but that doesn't make him from Bethlehem, I think. Okay, so this is what at least, uh, so, so I'm, I'm talking about from a, a historical scholarship point of view, not from a theological point of view. Just like the rabbis will come along and try to, and try to iron out differences and the Tosafot and the Talmud does this all the time. They, they make a living doing this, basically trying to harmonize texts that don't necessarily disagree. So, so here in Christian text, you'll have an attempt to harmonize. He was born here and then he moved here, that type of thing. But from a strictly historical point of view, what historians will argue was they will say he's probably really from Nazareth because there's no, no one is going to make up a story necessarily and say some guy's from Nazareth. It's like saying you're from the backwater countries in the middle of nowhere. Saying you're from Bethlehem. Why would someone say, from, why would someone want to say you're from Bethlehem? Descended from David. You got it. Remember that. You remember they're billing him as a descendant of David. He's the Mashiach. So therefore, you have every you have every uh, impetus if you want to make that argument to say he th he says from Bethlehem. And they talk about uh, Susan. Do you remember or Scott? Do you remember where is it in Matthew where it talks about the census and everyone has to return to the historical birthplace? I'm going to say it was it's Matthew, but. The whole census uh, idea, which is, I think, kind of interesting, is that the reason Mary and Joseph, or Miriam and Joseph, are on their way to Bethlehem is because of the census being taken. Now, what's a little confusing about that, of course, is that the census wouldn't be taken of a woman, particularly. The census probably would have been a male thing. So I don't know whether Scott has a thought about that, but uh, it seems to me that that trip that they took on the donkey uh, with her being pregnant was because a uh, census by Herod was commanded. Right, right. So, right. And Scott? Yeah, I, mean, I I think it was Luke that they they talk about the census. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's it's odd that they would have to move to be counted. It, 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 
there's there's this even Josephus doesn't even mention the town of Nazareth. There was no Nazareth. It probably was a cognomen, not a place. Nazir. He could be Nazir, not from Nazareth, because Josephus never mentions a town of Nazareth. Or yeah, or that also goes into the point that was so insignificant. It's not. It's like, it's like uh, in a historical writing, is someone really going to mention every incorporated area in 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 Delaware or or Pennsylvania or the United States? I mean, it could have just been a, an insignificant nothing or or well, cognate. One, one of the things that though, I think if you, uh, I don't, I, I don't remember whether it was Luke, but you might be right, uh, Scott. But the idea of Luke. Um, billing himself as a historian uh, gave him more reliability when he when he quoted these uh, various little details of history is that he was being quote accurate because he was a historian. So uh, that's what I understand anyway. That's that's my that's my okay. Okay, and um, just I, I, I think I was that's just, Irene. Yeah, I was I was just quickly looking up Nazareth, and in Hebrew, it's not rot. That is, there it's not there's a it's a Saudi, not a Zion. So it, there doesn't seem to be any connection at all with Nazir, um, and the settlement was inhabited back when was it now? Uh, I just had it. Um, it, it was, a, it's, it's old. I mean, it goes, let me, oh, there's even stuff here about the Stone Age. Let, let's see. Um, it might be derived from one of the Hebrew words for branch, netzar or net, netzer. But see, that's um, the point. In Greek, there's no distinguishment between a Zion and a Tzadi. In Hebrew, there is. So if somebody was trying to translate something from Hebrew into Greek, they wouldn't make the distinction between well, Nazar Greek. and Nazar. And Nazrat could have been created after the fact to, in, to try to establish the, the original place of Nazareth, but that doesn't mean it existed. An another existed. another theory holds that the Greek form of uh, Nazara, which is used in Matthew and Luke, may derive from an earlier Aramaic form of the name or from another Semitic language form. Uh that's interesting, Irene. I, I think that when you start getting into the etymology of it, the Hebrew yeah. etymology or the Aramaic etymology, you're really uh, kind of getting into interesting territory. Yeah, I, I was reading from Wikipedia, by the way. I did not, I did not know that off the top of my head. <laughs> you know, I just want to make that clear. Authoritative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I mean, not that there's a connection, but Netzer branch, as they, they talk about, you do have that messianic talk earlier on before you really start using the term Mashiach. It's always a branch of the house of David talking about figures like Zerubbabel during the early Second Temple period from the house of David. But scholars do, scholars do point out that historically speaking, they never found any record during this time period of people being told to return to a certain place, an ancestral portion or lot. To a do to do a census, so that's so so always puzzled scholars as to what's going what's going on here and that passage in the gospel. <laughs> okay, uh, where was I? So uh, we're talking about some other sects and some of the stuff we talked about before, but again, we'll this will all tie in nicely in a minute. So the main is so that we have the Sadducees from the Sadducite high priests. Uh, Sadok being the town, Sadok being the high priest, one of the two high priests under David, and then consolidated his power under his son Shlomo Solomon. We had the Pharisees or Perushim, the separatists. It's unclear who exactly they claim they were separating from. Uh, and we Scott once spoke about this. I think you you linked it up to something in the uh, Megillah, actually, Scott Megillah and Esther. Uh, the Essenes. It's really unclear. Uh, where the term even comes from, and they were they weren't known by Jewish traditional sources. Uh, I mean, like rabbinic sources, like the Talmud and stuff like that. Talmud, Midrash. We don't have these. We don't have the term Essenes come up where they talk about the Sadukim, the Sadducees, the Perushim, who basically the rabbis more or less become. Uh, and they mention so they're going to mention some other groups as well. But uh, even though the rabbis don't mention them. Josephus, Philo mentioned the Essenes in their Greek writing, 
and Pliny the Elder in his Latin writing. And what happened is later on, Renaissance Christian scholars start looking at these Greek writings and these Roman classics, and they and the, the new a new awareness of the Essenes, which the uh, Qumran sect was probably an Essene sect. There's a new awareness of them, and uh, Dio Rossi, who's a Jew, but he's part of his whole Renaissance scholarship, and he was in that circle with these Christian scholars. He's the first person to really start writing about this uh, time period from a, at least Jewish person from a critical point of view. In other words, not just looking at the Talmud and uh, rabbinic sources. He's looking at more as a historian would. So he starts to look at the Essenes as well. He, he was strong in Latin, weak in Greek, but passable Greek apparently. So he was able to start looking into particularly Josephus and Philo and Pliny a bit. And this really helped him. Uh, start bringing the Essenes to light from a Jewish point of view again. And he claims the Essenes are uh, the Bethusian uh, group, which is mentioned in the Talmud. Uh, they come up every now and then as a, as a small sect. It's kind of unclear who they are. So he claims this is actually, they're actually the Essenes by a different name. Are they or are they not? We don't really know. Hey, Rabbi? Yes, actually. Yeah. So let me exit out. That's the, I think that's the end oh. of my formal presentation. And uh, Go ahead, Scott. When you were talking about the Pharisees in that slide, and we were talking about Nazir and Netzer and Notesream, mm -hmm. we know that they, the Dead Sea Scroll sect was very big into wordplay. And because of that, Netzer, Notesream, they're all, they're all interrelated because they kind of phonetically sound alike. And one of them, they talk about a group that are Dorche. Chalakot, they seek smooth things. Chalakot with a kuf. But chalakot kind of sounds like chalakot, like halacha, those that pursue the halacha. Could that phrase have been used by the Dead Sea Scroll sect to refer to the Purushi? Because they were. Yes, yeah, so scholars actually will get to this later on. And scholars believe it does. And it's not a compliment the way they use it. You want right. to explain that, Scott? Why don't you explain why it's not a, because it sounds like that's a nice thing of the pursuing or smoothing out halakha. Explain why the, the negative connotation there. Well, because the Dead Sea Scroll sect, if they were, you know, they were xenophobic and, you know, they were definitely anti-Roman, they would treat, they're trying to be derogatory to the Perushim who were friendly with the Romans. They didn't want to take on the Romans. They, mm -hmm. you know, Hillel was friendly with Herod and, 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 you know, Hillel and Shammai, you know, opened the doors of Jerusalem to Herod. So they, they're trying to make a, uh, you know, they're, they're, they don't want to make waves. Mm -hmm. So they're seekers of smooth things, but they also are seekers of halak. So, so, so halak ha 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 is smooth in Hebrew, but it sounds like, it sounds like halakha. So eventually the idea also, but you, so you're writing what you're saying, but I just want to add on. It's like saying these guys play games with the halacha. They really try to manipulate text to make them say things they don't say. You remember Qumran, the Qumran sect is looking at these people and saying these guys play a lot of board games and uh, they're playing with the text. So it's a way of making fun of them for it, basically. Okay, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Jonathan. So you're uh, when you talk about the, the sect then uh, the, the Habakkuk, I mean, that, that it's a, they're continuing to reinterpret or, or, or the Torah or the, the writings. Um, um, I forgot the word you used, which is important to my point. Ongoing um, revelation. Maybe. Revelation, Jesus, thank you. So is that a scholarly term we would use today to describe what we see they're doing? Or they themselves have said, we're doing new revelation because we've had revelation from god or where we really have our act together well they they be, they believe that prophecy was still ongoing okay so in that sense that sense is a form of revelation where the mainstream uh, later on what becomes the mainstream rabbinic approach ends prophecy a couple hundred years earlier but so they were up front that i'm sorry just so i understand they were up front that revelation is still ongoing and we're doing it and this is what we how we see it and everybody else exactly. is wrong. You, you, yeah. Yeah, you are exactly correct. And not only that, they had this teacher of the righteous who this anonymous figure, we don't know who the guy was, but uh, this was this was to them 
a big deal the way we would make a big deal out of uh, Isaiah or something like that. This was this was probably their star prophet. So absolutely, it was an ongoing prophecy for them. And you could see how that gets you to a much different place than when you're dealing with a group <coughs> that it basically says at least a good part of our core canon, at least. And, and, and it's also important to understand that you only you only derive explicit halacha from the from the from the five books of Moshe itself from the from the Chumash, you you don't uh, so the, the Torah tell the Torah tells you uh, to keep Shabbat and all, all the keep kosher all these things. The the works of the prophets can be used to support ideas later on that are already there, but you don't you don't look at the prof, prophetic works and derive law as you the Talmud never derives law directly from prophetic works. It derives law from the Torah. So the fact that we have one group has basically closed down that core part of the canon and another group has not leads not only to theological differences, but also to very practical differences, as we would say, halacha lama'ase, practical halacha, what you do. And we, 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 we saw this, what day of the week are you celebrating Yom Kippur on? It leads to very large differences. So, and I don't not, not to put either Susan on the spot or yourself, so would Christian or would Christians say that Christianity is a new understanding or revelation of either not the Torah, but the prophets and the Torah? Is it that we've misinterpreted it and that's why you're reading in Isaiah about Son of Man or it's a new revelation? You want to take that, Susan? You don't ask, you don't ask difficult questions at all. <laughs> <laughs> well... I'm not sure I would tackle it that way, other than uh, the fact that what we know of Christianity today has nothing at all to do with the Second Temple period. What we know about Christianity today has everything to do with 300 years later in Constantine. So the whole, the whole idea that you would uh, have the discussion about whether it's revelation, if, if, you, were, if you were taking the Peshat, uh, the the New Testament as a kind of the plain sense, what you would do is you would have all Christians would be Jews. And that's, that's one of the things I talk about when, when I uh, spoke in front of, uh, of Oz Kodesh a, a couple of years ago, is that if, if it weren't for Constantine, all Christians would be Jews with a slightly different sect, if you will. It would be a different sect, but it would be Jewish. But Constantine, come, well, the, what the early church fathers and the early church fathers pre-Constantine started making the separation between uh, what was valid Christianity and what was valid or invalid Judaism. And that's where the split comes from, Jonathan. So uh, I'm not sure that revelation is the right word to use since we're talking 300 years later is what Christianity is we know that today. And yet I, I have heard it uh, said that the Christian view of the Bible, uh, that is that, that the, the New Testament is a continuation of and completion of the Tanakh. So yeah, you could look at that that way, that this was this was what comes next. Yeah, and if, if you if you weren't if you weren't part of the anti-Semitic strain of Christianity. Uh, that would be a route that you could go without being triumphalist, where well, without having this Jesus thing become a triumphalist idea, but rather part of a continuum of Judaism. It's a big issue, and it's really hard to discuss in five or ten minutes, but it's probably the key issue in my mind about where Christianity went astray. <clears throat> and it took a couple hundred years for it to go astray, but it certainly did. And uh, so you really, you can't talk about Jesus's form of Christianity because there was none. Jesus's form was Jewish. And uh, so it's, it's a very complicated idea. You're and right. uh, thanks for asking it, Jonathan. You brought up what are probably a really important, uh, an important right. point. Right, so so Jesus was believed to be basically a, some sort of apocalyptic Jew as there were a lot of Jews with different beliefs. and. He was an apocalyptic Jew, most likely, possibly a, a, a possibly a more urbanized scene than the Qumran sect. Some scholars believe that. 
the, the what I mean, uh, th there's a dichotomy in Christianity as to even how to answer this question, or at least historically, where you had the, the most ex extreme anti Jewish was uh, <coughs> Marcionism. Uh, Susan, Marcion. Right? <clears throat> Marcion was one. Um, Marcion, thank you. Uh, there are there are several who were pretty extreme, and all the way up through the 400s uh, with Chrysostom. Excuse me. Okay, but, but Mar Marcion <coughs> basically took the point of view that there was nothing redeeming or or a value with the Jew with the Jewish Torah. Where later on, uh, the mainstream Christian view is the Jewish Torah is also of importance. If you go to you talk to ministers, a lot of times they they, they love talking about the Bible, shall we say? But um, it was there was controversy, and eventually it's decided that uh, there's the, the the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible, or they use the terms new. Old Testament and New Testament, which I don't because they're, they're loaded, as you could see to a certain degree, but uh, but you can see there's more of a, a continuum. And uh, ultimately, what, 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 happened, what happens is arguments are made. This is more ter like Paula was very good at doing this, basically talking about, and we already mentioned this, how things in the, in the, in the Torah really reference, really reference what's going to happen as Christianity is forming so uh and, and i think islam in a sense does something similar and they come along and they don't reject judaism and christianity they basically say we're building on it this is uh i don't know what the right word but it's uh i don't know if improvement is an offensive word or the right word or the word they would use but it's basically we're building on what's uh already there as opposed to rejecting what's already there so and, and so you really see the progression in the abrahamic faiths is you have Judaism it, it, it is the eldest of them, and then you have Christianity comes of it, and then Islam. Scott. It's got a separate issue. Back two points on your earlier slides. You mentioned that you know these sects would look down upon other people's holidays, but we know that even the Hazal, I mean, Rabbi Gamliel forced Rabbi Yehoshua to come to him on the day Rabbi Yehoshua predicted his Yom Kippur. So even the even the Pharisees were disputing days, right, Rabbi? It's in the Talmud. That that's in that's in, that's in that's in the Mishnah and Rosh Hashanah. It's a great little vignette, where that that's an argument really over. Uh, and it's an argument over a calendar, but it's an argument over when the when when the moon was sighted, when the new moon was sighted, which affects when you celebrate, obviously Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the month, and then ten days later, Yom Kippur. And there, what's going on here is you have this argument over, but the, the real point there is basically there's a certain amount of uh, real politic or power politics going on, I think is one of the points there. Basically, Rabbi Gamliel is saying, look, Rabbi Yossi, you're a smart guy, you're a scholar and wisdom, I'm your student, but guess what? You know who sits in the uh, chair of the authority here? Who's the head honcho of the Betin? It's me. So. The day I say Yom Kippur and the day my court says is Yom Kippur is Yom Kippur. And he actually forces poor Rav, Rav Yossi to show up on the, on the day that Rav Yossi thinks is Yom Kippur with his makel, with his staff and a, with a bag of money, right. clearly violating Yom Kippur. So what's really going on here? Rabbi Yossi is basically publicly saying, I will accept the date that you declare as Yom Kippur even to the point where uh, the date that the date that I think is Yom Kippur, I will violate the laws of Yom Kippur basically to show that I accept your authority. So that's really I think, okay. the point of that story. The second point I wanted to make is you opened up by talking about Babylonian names of the calendars that we've stuck to. Correct. One of the, I, I read a book that was interesting about the issue of Mamacharata Shabbat, the day after Shabbat, because it's so weird that you know, we say we count from the we count from the day after the Shabbat. Well, what is that Shabbat? It's a day of rest. Well, it it's probably the first day of Passover. Well, they this book said that the Babylonian word Shabbatun Shabbatun means full moon. And if that's the case, and if that's the origin of where the Hebrew gets it from then that makes it absolutely clear that the first day of Passover, because the first day of Passover is the full moon. So that, that, would, that would establish why that, you know, why is there a discrepancy? Because Shabbat mean, usually means the seventh day or the Shabbat. 
it, it, it's very weird that the, here's an origin in, of a Babylonian word that means Shabbat. Even in the prophets, there are several places where we talk, the Tanakh talks about Sabbaths and new moons. It's kind of odd. Why do they talk about Sabbath and new moons? But if the origin of the Hebrew word Shabbat means full moon, then that would make sense that the full moon and the new moon would be put together. So it's just an odd thing that in the, that the Babylonian word for the full moon is Shabbatun. Is it, wasn't Shabbatun also, wasn't it that they believed it was once every seven days they would hide in their houses from kind of ghost type of characters? I, I remember something, it, was, it, it had a mystical meaning or something. My, yeah, I remember. I, I, th I think this is the term Babylonians, where once every seven days, basically, they believe that uh, uh, the creepy uh, goblin types guy, guys would come out, so you'd have to hide in hide in your house, which may have been why the Torah may have been why the Torah introduces the idea of Shabbat right. with a similar word, but kind of changes the meaning. This is very common in the evolution of what from one religion to another. It takes an idea, incorporates certain elements, but then drastically changes the meaning behind it. So yeah. what we're saying is on Shabbat, instead of instead of Shabbatun, instead of hiding out from the ghosts once every seven days, we're going to make it a day of rest and a day where you let everyone in your society rest. So it has a nice egalitarian type of idea as well, just as scholars argue to Corbin Pesach, some sort of Paschal spring offering to protect the flock was probably an ancient idea even well before Pesach ever happened. But what happened is when Moshe comes along and with God, they, they uh, changed the meaning. Instead of, instead of uh, giving an offering to the gods to protect your flock as they're going out to pasture, which was uh, vital to their economy, instead you're uh, giving this Paschal offering as a uh, way of remembering that God freed you. So, you. so you do a ritual that's already similar, but then you change the meaning behind it. This happens again all the time, you see, as we go from one religion to another religion. All right. Any other good, great discussion? Any other uh, words of wisdom? No? I, okay. I wanted, I wanted to go back to, uh, if there's time, I just wanted to go, go ahead, back Susan. to when you talked about the sources of the Gospels uh, and um, <clears throat> and uh, talked about this Q idea, I'd like to kind of expose the idea that there are a group of scholars, uh, and I don't follow them because I think they're incorrect. There's a group of scholars who claim that the gospels, all of the gospels, probably not John, but the other ones, were written much later by people who may or may not have been Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who may have been John, you know, Peter and whatever his name is, Scott. And so uh, that they came along later and they followed the oral stories that were flop flopping around. Uh, and the only source that they had was this unknown, now unknown source called Q. I reject the whole thesis of that. And the reason I do is because there's no suggestion in Matthew, Mark and Luke that it was written any by anybody except Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whoever they were, and that they, especially Luke, followed Jesus. But the scholars claim that some of these writers were later, and that's when they talk about later, they mean after, let's say, 90 or 100, that, that it was the next generation that these gospels were written by. And I think if you go there, what you do is you destroy the historical value, uh, whatever historical value there is in the gospels, I think what you do is you cut into that and destroy it in order to prove some, some nonsense view of, of scholarship. Uh, but there is a whole school out there and the whole school out there is very influential. And so what you get is this, um, uh, this group of scholars saying, oh no, these gospels weren't written in the second temple period, they were written later. So it's just, it's just a piece of discussion, but I, I think it's an important one because there are scholars making their point. Yeah, they're, they're making the points based on the text and saying, well, if these guys were supposed to be um, uneducated uh, fishermen or whoever, uh, they sure write Greek well. 
They, they write like highly educated people. And so that's, you know, and the idea, you know, whether it's one person named Mark or somebody else, I mean, that happens all the time. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah was written by like three or four Isaiahs, or if they were Isaiah. But at any rate, yeah, it's a, um, it, it is an interesting question. And I, I think it's getting late, so sorry. Yeah, so, so that's fine, just to, so yeah, so the Susan's point with the academic center, just kind of echoing what Irene says, is um, if they were Jesus's companions or traveling in that group, they, they seem more educated than uh, necessarily seems to be the people are traveling with Jesus are, and they probably would have spoken Aramaic, not necessarily a, a fancy, uh, fancy Greek. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's Of course, since we don't have the original documents, we don't know whether it was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. We have no clue at all. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so exactly. anybody who says that it was written in Greek, I, I don't think there are too many. Um, there are too many Jewish expressions in the Gospels to have been written in Greek. Too well, many of them. But that could have been Jewish collaborators working with them. Anyhow. <laughs> All right, let's not Sorry. go there, Scott. Okay. okay, well, uh good discussion. We'll leave on a, leave it on a high note. Okay, Chicago, thank you, Rabbi. Everyone. Yes, Chicago. Yes, Chicago. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Lila Tobin. Good night, everyone. Oh, Rabbi, Rabbi, I have a question 